Well, I recently had a chance to talk to Jim Hackett. Jim Hackett is just an amazing person. Uh, he was, I got to know him first as the uh, CEO at Steelcase here in Grand Rapids. Uh, and then I found he was going to retire. I felt badly about it. Then in short order, he ended up as the uh, uh, athletic director at University of Michigan. And then he transitioned from that, became the CEO at Ford Motor Company. Uh, and and I, we always joked with with Jim that you don't do retirement very well. And he doesn't because he's got a brilliant mind that continues to think about how to make things better. He has a contribution mentality about how to improve the lives of those around him, uh, and whether it's through an organization or whether it's through a personal relationship. That's what I've always enjoyed with him. Uh, it's just how he uh, was such a great friend and would always try to help me think about how I could do things better and always offering his time and his wisdom uh, every step of the way. We had a great conversation. He has a, a, a lot of big thoughts uh, of how he really you know, approaches and includes technology uh, in, in the businesses that he led and how we can think about that a little bit. But uh, uh, so we had a lot of fun talking about that and a little fun about uh, he played football at Michigan. Uh, so we had a little football conversation too, but it was a fun conversation uh, and I hope you enjoyed as well. We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together, and finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? Well, Jim, I'm, I'm so, uh, so grateful to, to have this chance to talk with you today and to uh, just roll through some things. And I, and as we're starting, you know, I've, I've enjoyed the relationship with you, you know, so much over the years when you're at Steelcase, U of M, Ford, and, and then community leader as you have been. But one of the early experiences that we had, and we can maybe just even kind of start to share about, was the competition we had for raising money for United Way between Steelcase and Amway. And, uh, uh, and to you know, cut to the chase, Amway lost the competition, Steelcase won. Now, I don't remember that, but, but it's kind of you to <laughs> remind me of that, Doug. And, and the wager was the, the loser would host the other company's truck at the headquarters. Yeah. And Steelcase had beautiful trucks uh, at that time. And there's this beautiful steel case truck in front of the headquarters, and we have our ceremony with. We were talking with Jim and with Jim Stelter and, and you, and and uh, I, I came back in from that, and I had a question from Jay Van Andel, who was looking down and going, "What is a steel case truck doing <laughs> doing in front of the Amway headquarters?" I, I can so, only imagine. You know, <laughs> well, and and our listeners need to know when Doug was involved in that campaign. I got involved because I think I succeeded you as uh, running the campaign. And I was so worried about the kind of energy you brought uh, to that and how fun it was to serve on your cabinet. And and we did a good job. You know, we we, we We had fun. Humbly did a good job. But that was the other thing I wanted to add. We had fun. You know, like... Well, these community things are so rewarding, but we we took it to another level, like frat brothers, you know. And right. We had fun with the bet, and I I was relating uh, for the listeners to Doug about having dinner with Jim Stelter, and it was just it was just such a great moment to see the community all be focused on how are we going to you know achieve our goals, and then of course that that reward was not singular to Steelcase, both companies, as you know. I think. I think we still pulled the Amway truck over to Steelcase. I, I think I convinced him. I can't remember that for sure. But <laughs> you, you may have been uh, kind enough to I, let I, us well, do I was, that. I was so proud, uh, you know, of, of what we both did that I thought I think we owe you that. So thank you. That was that was so much fun. But yep. those that was kind of one of the early interactions yes. that we had together when I had a chance to to meet you and and, and to uh, to know you and to see really and that's what I'd love to kind of just unpack. Sure, it's really you in a different in different capacities and and different roles that you've had, but you still have this amazing you know, uh, perspective on innovation on technology. On competitiveness mm-hmm. and on you know on, on goals and mm-hmm. what's needed to achieve them mm-hmm. in the community 
in business, mm -hmm. and in life. And that's really the, 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 the key that I've seen from you in, in all these different capacities and, and what you've done. Well, I, I have to add the moment, I can't miss the moment to, to say something to you about right. um, the standing that I had in the community because we were both young <laughs> in a community when we got to know each other, yeah. younger, I should say. <laughs> younger. I, feel we're, I should say we're both still young. But, but uh, there was a... I call it an oligarchy of really talented people that helped build our city. Sure. You know, Rich DeVos, Bob Pugh, yeah. you know, John Canepa. And um, so I got to meet your dad uh, maybe before I met you. And I got to, I got to tell him this, you know, that when, when he spoke, it was like having, you know, like an artist having a blank palette with, with all the paints in front of them. And it wasn't sure what was going to appear, right. you know, when, I got to tell him this actually, and, and, uh, and every time he was done, it was beautiful, you know, it was his painting. I said, I learned so much from you because it was hard for me when I was younger. I didn't have the confidence he did when I would speak, yeah. and I had all these ideas in my head, as you've just alluded to. Yeah. yeah. And so I cite this wherever I go, that watching him gave me it's a teachable moment, you know, where you can see people that are, have mastery of something and they don't mind sharing it at all sure. and you can emulate. So I just, I need you to hear that. And then the other thing I told him was our blessing is that when you're a father and you're raising a family and I had two boys and I saw what he, you know, the three boys and your sister. And I said, you know, that's your greatest achievement, isn't sure. it? You know, and and uh, but because everyone stayed here in town and helped us get better, which is, by the way, why I came back after yeah. all these things. And so I just, I just want to tell you how special it is to talk to you today because when I was younger, that influence. And then as we get to meet each other, of course, apples don't fall too far from the tree, as we both know. Yeah. But in another way, they have to have an independence, you know, and define themselves, which, which I feel that about working with you. And we got assigned to uh, some of the education problems together, which right. we can talk about. Right, but, right. But if I left you with a summary, I always saw myself as an oddity in the way that I did approach thinking about things. But not, I don't think the issues were odd, just the way I approached it. And I, I don't have a pithy answer for where does that come from other than I had an artistic mother and my dad was a veterinarian and a very entrepreneurial and an inventor. So the house with art art and that mm -hmm. was not a lot of rules. I mean it was kind of a wide open thing with four boys. Right. Very, very competitive and and uh, loving. Yeah. And so that kind of gives you the sense of where this all starts, you know, is is kind of the way I was raised. Isn't that isn't that interesting? So I was going to ask you about that. Talk a little bit more about that with four brothers, with your parents, and that environment, and, and and how you started to see or learn about yourself as it, it, whether it was you know school or football or early career. When you started to see some of these things, and you go, boy, I've got these ideas in my head, and I I tend to look at things a little differently than other people, and how you got comfortable with that and yeah. really develop that as as your superpower your strength in, in how you would lead organizations well the at the at the beginning of it and I, I'm going to ask you to think about this and maybe remark is I would watch and my dad's eyes would get big okay. you know think of about when you could see them excited now they were excited about their kids or sure. watching their favorite team win but I'm talking about when he was talking about his ideas, mm -hmm. he changed. And the enthusiasm and the excitement, it was almost like he was floating in front of me, you know. He had, he had a very interesting idea as a veterinarian about the future of cattle feedlots. So he, he, he left his veterinary practice and invented a totally environmentally friendly feedlot. Now today, Bill Gates is in the last two weeks is in the news saying the number one polluting factor is still large animals. That's right. why they're trying to have us move off of meat, you know, to these, uh, I forget what they're called, but, you know, plant-based foods. Right. My father had a system 
of the way you receive the, the animals, the way you feed them, the way you treat the waste, and, and kind of contained all that. And there's 25,000 cattle in the operation when he did it. So I'm really proud to just mention that because uh, Wendy's and McDonald's and all these things were just starting. So right. he was a supply chain for them. Uh, ran into some issues. So I got to watch disappointment, you know, and pivoting. Uh -huh. And so, Doug, that, that, that's the first instinct. The second instinct I, was my mother would, we had community plays in this little town. I grew up in Ohio. And she would spend all day, she smoked as my dad did. So my mom would drink Cokes and smoke all day, painting the sets of this theater with another woman that was very, very creative. So her eyes would get big, you know, when she was involved, immersed in that. I, I just have to say that's the genesis of who I become because I would start to get excited about ideas. And there's later I can tell you the story. I start to meet people. But I, to the listeners and to you, there's a script that we all look at when we're young and we're not sure of ourselves. So I put myself into a lane, which was okay. I went to work for a very large company kind of in a, you know, it was called, they were called academy companies. Like if you went to Procter & Gamble, you would be trained, you know. Sure. And I didn't really like it. I liked the people, but I didn't like the culture. And... And so that leads me to the next step where I start to get exposed to people like I want to be like and be, be creative with. That's how that kind of happens. Isn't that something? Yeah, the contrast of that was really what spirited me. But it's interesting how you see, and I love, again, you have a great way of describing things. When, you're, when you see the enthusiasm in somebody else's eyes, yeah. and, and then you kind of start to figure that out when do you have that moment yeah. when do I start to experience that yeah I, I can't um, I can't leave kind of the the history part of you without talking about football <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But first of all how'd you get from Ohio to Michigan I, we've never really fully explored that one and then no, and, it, and as a former quarterback at Purdue <laughs> you know I have so much respect for for both of us going into programs I almost went to Purdue which I'll come back and tell you but oh, right but, uh, but, yeah, my dad went to Ohio State, yeah. and he was captain of the team yeah. and an All-American as a junior. So he had a, now we would tease him and say it's because everyone was in the war and there weren't other players. <laughs> but, but he was kept out of uh, World War II because of they put all the MDs on the front line to take care of our troops. Mm -hmm. They kept the veterinarians back uh -huh. to take care of people. Oh, okay. So he, he was in vet school while he was playing uh, football. So, uh, but in his, in his record, and then there's four of us, I have an older brother who goes to Ohio State and plays Big Ten, uh, two brothers go to the Ivy League and play football, and I'm the last one, and we've run out of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, seriously, you know, it was like with Dad's ventures and all this, and I, I wanted to go probably to Dartmouth or Cornell was where I was first targeting, and, and, I, and I went to Purdue, yeah. and it felt and I'm being really uh, sincere about yeah. how much I love this. It felt like the way I grew up. You know, yeah. there was a there was an authentic nature to Purdue, and and uh, um, Alex Agassi was the yeah. coach. Was that was he your coach? No, no. And uh, a and, bit after that. and he offered me a scholarship on the day of the recruiting, and I said I got to think about it. And he goes, "That's the problem with kids today. They can't make a decision." You know, he knew how to. <laughs> so I went back and told my dad because I hadn't gone to Michigan yet. I said, I don't think I'm going to go to Michigan. I'm going to look. I think I'm going to call Coach Agassi. And he said, well, you made a commitment to Bo Schembechler. you got to go. Yeah. Later I learned that Dad played against Alex when they were both in the Big Ten. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so there was, there was all kinds of history there. But, but going to Michigan, Doug, <laughs> was, was – I didn't think I was really um, – I thought I was big enough, but I didn't think I was fast enough. Okay. Turns out that was true. I can <laughs> confirm that because I was a linebacker in mm -hmm. high school. And, uh, and so I got there. I, I, I made the decision because of the business school. I really wanted to, to be near business, and I liked the reputation. So that's how I get drafted up there. And Schembechler was hard to say no to. I mean, he was, he was a spectacular human. Yeah. I got very close to him later. And I shared that with President Ford. You know, sure. we both really liked him a lot. And so, yeah, that, that experience, uh, I'll leave you with, 
it taught me, I, I, I put this in my notes, it taught me something about resilience. Yeah. Do you remember those feelings in practice and <laughs> the size and speed of everybody? And everyone's faster, everyone's yeah. bigger than you've ever experienced before. Yeah. And you're trying to just, you know, hang in there. Yeah, and, and then, and I'll speak for myself, not starting, I meant I was cannon fodder for the starters, you know. I, I was there, too. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. That was my role, too. And, yeah. and that, the, the listeners need to know that's not an easy assignment because you're playing against the best every day. Now, that made me better. Right. You know, in my senior year, I got to play every game, but it was because, you know, the score had gotten far enough ahead. That, uh, so I have only fond memories yeah. about it. But the, the takeaway is... I found physically that the boundaries I thought I had, I could go further. And when I was a CEO, I kind of thought of it the same way. I mean, how many times did you go to China? Have you ever added up the number of trips? <laughs> Actually, St- Stephen Andel and I talked about that. We're in s- somewhere in the 80s, and so uh, 80, the, 80 trips, something like that. And, and you know, the, the listeners know that's a 30-hour commitment. Yeah. Which, if you have a forty-hour week, you just spend in three fourths of it, you know, in the air, and and so I, when I hated that, I would think back to August practice in football and go, "Hey, Hackett, you could get through this," and right. of course it would end, and I'd be fine, you know. Yeah. Isn't that isn't that great? Yeah, I, I, playing with Coach Schembeck, that must have been an incredible experience. It, incredible, and you know, I've said this publicly. Um, the the he gave a speech once. We, and he had this presence uh, again, like your father. He could walk in a room, and it would just, the, it would just, you could hear a pin drop because people knew when they talked, you were going to really enjoy it. Bo was like that as well, and it wasn't always, you know, fire and brimstone. In fact, he was more of an, an analytical guy in a world where data now mag- matters in football. Bo had done this in the analog way; he made all these charts and things. If it's third down inside the 30 and the clock says, this is what play you should call. He, had, he did all that kind of work. Wow. But he gave a whole talk on t- integrity. And I've, again, mentioned this, which is his father was a civil servant in Ohio, and there's a chance to go up the ladder in the fire department. And so he has to take another test. As they go to get the test or take the test, one of the other people competing for it says, I've found the answers already. Somehow he got a hold of them. And he tells his dad, take these answers. And Bo relays that his father said, no, I can't. I'd be cheating. So you get to the end of the story. The other guy got the job. Yeah. So Bo asked a question at the dinner table. Why would you let him take that job? And he goes, who wants to win by cheating? Yeah. That was Bo's message. Yeah. So I've never forgotten that. Wow. And I thought, you know, he, it was like he put the standard there for himself because he wouldn't want to disappoint his dad. Right. And then I, I took that into my role. Now, I, we're not perfect as humans, right? But I, only, I, I, can, I tell people I only told one lie in my business career, and I, and I couldn't sleep. Mm. You know, uh, I never lied as a CEO because I made that mistake when I was younger, yeah. try and save somebody's ego. And, and then I met President Ford and uh, Bob Pugh. They both, all three of these men were like heroes because they, they just made you understand that integrity was non-negotiable. Yeah. Because you can't get trust if people don't believe you're telling the truth. They may think you're, you know, bull malarkey <laughs> or, you know, you're exaggerating, but they, they don't sit there and think they can't believe what you're saying. And that's your podcast, you know, <laughs> which is about integrity. You know, is what the way I took it. Yeah, it, so. it's belief. What do you believe in? What do you believe in? What are the things that are important to you? Yeah, whatever the cost. And you, I, you don't compromise them, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. And and we both were in settings. I would speak in business schools. We were talking about speaking at Purdue, which I did, and I I told that story that you have to you have to practice that you're going to be in a situation that the stress is as high as you can imagine. Because you think, well, I will be fine. I had good parents, I had a good coach. But no, you're in that setting and the stakes are so high. How are you gonna act? So I would, I would relay to younger folks in sessions like that, you have to practice that. You have to look in the mirror and say, I've just been asked, are you gonna meet your public companies? Right. Are you gonna meet your earnings target? I could do it, but it would not be right. And it wouldn't be right maybe for the family that owned the company or whatever. 
And so, uh, yeah, those things are lasting, aren't they? They stay with us. They stick with it. I, yeah. I, I love it. Talk a little bit. You, you mentioned President Ford. And you had a great relationship with President Ford. And we serve on the foundation board together. And I, I'm really curious how that went. You know, the, yeah, I never had the Michigan connection. <laughs> You've got the Michigan connection, yeah. Michigan football connection, the center <laughs> connection. And you had a great relationship with President Ford. Well, being with you and others, uh, of our era with him was as enjoyable as being with him. So I, I don't want you to, I don't want the listeners to diminish that because we, it was like the, um, the Amway steel case thing. We just, we went into these things with so much enthusiasm yeah. Yeah. that you, it was never a waste of time. Yeah. Secondly, he came when I was a senior in 1976 to practice. He was president. Okay. He landed the helicopter, Marine what? one on the practice field. No kidding. And of course, can you imagine at that age? I mean, at any time somebody saw that and witnessed that, it'd be larger than life. But here we are at a football field, and he came to training table. And so, because I was a senior center, I wasn't the starter, I got to sit right across from him wow. in the room with 100 players. And, and I was, you know, it, it was like a floating moment. You know, I was just so captured by him. As we were walking out, Doug, there was no, um, iPhones or anything, but people brought those Kodak instant cameras sure. to get selfies. <laughs> and so the players were doing this, you know, I'm leaning and showing how you would lean into a picture. Well, the Secret Service started to get nervous because they just, they all started to come to get the selfie. This guy elbows me in the stomach. I wasn't really pushing, I was just getting pushed. And it was one of the Secret Service guys. I mean, it was a nice hit to the stomach. So I, you know, I helped him back people off. Do you know when I became athletic director at Michigan, that same gentleman was assigned to me because he had retired from the Secret Service and he was security in Michigan. No at, kidding. And he was assigned to me as a brand new athletic director because of some stresses that they had. And I go, I know you from somewhere. Oh my goodness. And, he, and we talked, he goes, yeah, I was the guy that hit you in the stomach. He goes, I remember that. <laughs> So that's how I meet President Ford, and I don't have any really relationship in 76, but when I became CEO of Steelcase, sure. I get invited to things with you and others, and I took a picture from my senior year up to him at the table, yeah. Yeah. and he was sitting there, and he was kind of having, it was a moment, you know, he was a very vibrant guy, but this is 15 years before he passed. His, it, but he, you could tell he's probably just tired from the circuit, right? And his head was down a little bit. So I thought I maybe shouldn't interrupt him. He just, his eyes got so bright. Again, the bright eyes thing. Not because of me, but that picture with Bo and he. Bo was handing him a letter jacket. And I said, Mr. President, this is me right there. Well, that led to every time I saw him, every time we would talk about football. Sure. And then I started, I felt bold enough, before the Ohio State game, I would call him <laughs> the last five years yeah. and say, are you ready? You know, and, you know, the toe to leather was a term that Bo would use, the toe to leather at 1 p.m. Yeah. And before Bo died, he used to do that. And that's what I, I tried to continue for him. Sure. And, and then uh, quickly and totally randomly, my youngest son, Rob, ends up in New York as uh, uh, right out of college at Condé Nast. His cube mate is Susan Ford's daughter, Heather. Oh, but they don't know, the two kids don't know that the parents know each other. And there's, there happens to be a nasty boss that Rob kind of rescues Heather from this person being really abusive to her. So Heather tells her mother about this guy she said, cute guy that she's working with and <laughs> that rescues her. And, and that leads to a moment where they're reflecting that both, uh, Rob says, my mom and dad are in Ann Arbor for a week. And, and she says, well, my mom and dad are there too. It was when they were dedicating the Ford School of Public Policy. Okay. And that's when the kids realize that we're, we know each other oh, really well. So that kind of explains why I have such fondness for, you know, the Ford children. I've kept really close relationships with all of them. I served on the uh, Ford School of Public Policy board with Mike, um, Susan, I've just told you about. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I think that's a precious family. And I just, I got to applaud everything you did in the background, you know, to make, 
make it so he could move around and do all these things. You know, I, I always so respected that and appreciated that. Because he was a truly wonderful human. Wouldn't he, you agree? Uh, he, a, a, absolutely. One of the one of the prize moments I have is there was an event where he was attending, and kind of in the I'm in the back of the room, and I'm with Peter Cook, who's a, another just a wonderful one of those leaders in Grand Rapids, uh, a generation ahead of us, and uh, they sneak President Ford in the back door, and he he kind of walks in, and of course the rest of us kind of there, you know, are a little bit startled, and 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 he walks in and goes. Peter, how are you? <laughs> and Peter turns, goes, well, Jerry, how are you doing? They both went to South High School. These are friends from you know childhood. And it was one of those times I'm just pinching myself. Part of me is like, don't leave. Just sit here and hang on every word. And the other part is, you're in the wrong spot. You got to let these two guys just you know be together and be friends and not try to eavesdrop on their conversation. Um, and it was just priceless. Uh, because he he just he, in 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 that sense he never left Grand Rapids. No, he was that, always that. just you know Jerry Ford from Grand Rapids. He had friends here. He interacted with everybody here. But you know what he brought. You know, and again our theme for the you know for the uh, the Ford aircraft carrier integrity at the helm. Yeah, and and uh, one of the things I did. There's so many things everybody did, but I had a special steel case chair made for him with the yes. emblem on it yes yes and i and uh wouldn't you know um it's my fault if you have a hardwood floor you have to have a different caster so you have the friction i just presumed he was on carpet out out in california okay. where and he fell he fell in the chair i oh, mean he no. was fine yeah um so i had a second one made with the right wheels and he's just such an authentic guy he goes why well, i, I I can't get rid of this other chair. You know? <laughs> so he just had two of them. Yeah, so he, and and we fixed the the wheels, the casters on one of them. But but no, it, 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 there's so many stories yeah. that I'm so glad. One I want to leave you with because you hinted about the tech stuff. Yeah. So I'm in a boardroom w- with your brother Dick. Uh, we served together in a wonderful time at Old Kent Bank. Sure. And I came back from Palo Alto because of my involvement with IDO. IDO, yeah. yeah. And and Dick's, I bring. Uh, I wasn't doing anything, you know, within, without integrity. I was okay. The press was going to see this device that they were making, which the, they were originally Palm Pilots that somebody else had done, but this was the handspring. So these were these little devices that preceded for our listeners, iPhones, yeah, you know. Okay, you okay. couldn't call on them, but you could do your calendaring. You had a little digital pen. Right. So Dick and I were talking about it. I was showing it to him. Well, I leave that, and I go t- to the museum to meet the president because I was trying to help him get the furniture right in the museum. So I brought him. IDO let me bring him a brand new one. I said, you know, you just got to wait a day because it's all being launched tomorrow. Yeah. And I hand it to him, and I say, Mr. President, because, you know, you got to think in his world, so many things he's gotten as president. And sure. I said, there's more computing power in this than you had to run the missile system when you were president. And they, <laughs> the pho- photographer takes a picture, and you should see his face. I have it in my office today yeah. where I'm going like this with my hands. I'm demonstrating like I'm in the palm of your hands. And his face just gets, he's just beaming like he can't believe that, yeah. you know, which is which is the insight about what happened to computing power in his lifetime, you know, yeah. compounded. How things have changed. Um, yeah, and and that's happened again. Like yeah. there's more power in the iPhone today, the brand new one, than probably uh, one of the Bush the, the Bushes had to run the, the, the system. Yeah. And, you know, just gonna keep and, and being able to use that story over and over. But he loved continue. that. He loved, he loved, uh, a notion of a story about how we were all going to be modern in an optimistic way, you know, right. that, that I couldn't give him enough of that stuff. He would ask me all the time, what are you working on now, you know, and I would talk to him. And of course, it was reinforcing to me, which is one of the lessons, isn't it, in the believe, is where do you get your confidence from? You know, so we talk about our parents, right. you know, being, if they're good role models and nurturing and they, and they had to be disciplinarians. And if they, if a parent says the wrong thing, that can affect you later, right? Don't think about it. Yeah, that that bending your knee when you're swinging your golf club, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
President Ford only gave me confidence. Yeah. I never, I mean, and when I would talk to him, I just, I think that was his superpower. Yeah. He didn't talk, you know, he didn't, he didn't over talk, but he, I think the people who worked for him all loved him for yeah. that reason. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're so yeah. right. Yeah. So, so take, take this track a little bit and um, put the pieces together. So whether it's at Steelcase or Ford, and we'll talk, we'll talk U of M uh, a little bit because, you know, and one of the, the things I always joke about you is you don't retire really well. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you left Steelcase. But I'm, you, I want you to hold me back the next yeah. call that comes. Just. Yeah, when you left Steelcase, it's like, oh, that's great. You know, yeah, I'm going to 20 years, and, I'm done. And then know. all of a sudden, yeah. at U of M. And, and, yeah. but, but talk about how you applied technology uh, you know, some, some of the examples, man, where you applied technology, because I, I remember listening to you when you were at Ford as well, talking about how technology was impacting, uh, you know, new products that were being developed. You did the same thing at Steelcase. That's what IDO was all about, innovation and, you know, design-centered thinking. Yes. You, you know, how, how or, or what is it? That's did I right. get that right? Okay. You did. You nailed I, it. I got it right. Good yeah. deal. And um, so talk a little bit about how technology, how you apply technology in those cases and how we should think about maybe technology today as you talk about the advances, you got AI that's, you know, that's, you know, not only knocking on the door, but has, is going to have a huge impact. Um, but how did you look at technology? How did you apply technology? And, and how does that maybe help us think about technology, you know, uh, in our world today. Well, I love that you gave, opened that door because as as I've left the Ford assignment, I'm on a couple of boards, but this is how I'm spending all my time, frankly. Okay. And and I'll, I'll develop that for you, but I'll, I'll answer the first part of the question is, there was a famous uh, professor at Michigan with two initials, C.K. Prahalad, and he and um, Gary Hamill, who was at the University of London, formed this concept when CK was a professor at Michigan, uh, core competencies, they called it. So any kind of business, if you looked at their success, there's these core things that they that really they had mastery right. of. Yep. And you you know, if I think of Amway or Steelcase, we can yeah. name them. Right. But, and and two are, both of our responsibilities during our era, these, these family companies can level off. You know, they grow really fast. And then what's the next era, right? right. So Prahalad had been brought brought in, not by me, but uh, the guy, that Jerry Myers, who was for three years the CEO of Steelcase. And he told this story about the Casio company, which we, we, when we were kids, they made electric watches. watches, but they also made musical instruments. And basically what they were doing, Doug, was they were taking kind of old analog things and putting chips in them. And with the chip, you could give it more utility and better margins. So that was kind of I gave you like three lectures down to one sentence, what Prahalad. So I started looking at steel case furniture and thought, where is the version of the chip in the product? Now, it wasn't as practical, right? But in the very beginning, as computers were coming in, I thought, well, we got to have plugs so that you can plug your computer in. You didn't have to get on the floor. Later, as the internet appeared, how do we make the internet manifest itself in a conference room through a screen and then how can you control that so it's really faster and see these are all the things that we later brought to market but I would tell you it was the same instinct mm -hmm. as I go to Ford and there's you know legions of PhD engineers technologists but they miss this point they miss this point that the car the way a car is wired is like I remember as a kid when we put this string lights on our Christmas tree and one ball was out, oof, we have to take them all off. Right. It's, it has to do with the way a circuit's designed. And so a car, because it progressively gets more technically fit, you have, a, you have a system that manages the power steering, you have a system that manages your power brakes. They're called ECUs, and they could be 20 to 30 of them in a car. And they work, I'm, I don't want any car people to get mad at me, mm -hmm. but at the worst time, uh, where they were limited. They worked like in a serial uh, way that the lighting did, where, meaning you had to... If one failed. One failed, and or if you added one, you had to go change everything that was downstream. So that's why they didn't add a lot. 
So I thought I got to fix this to at least get the capability, and that's as far as I can talk about it. I was I, I, I fathered this phrase: "Smart vehicle meets the smart world." Because what I what I meant by that was the car is going to get so intelligent that it'll drive itself, versus starting at the other end, which we're going to make a robotic car. I didn't like that because. There's never been a statement about a robot coming that ever worked for anybody. Remember when we were kids, they were going to have this and that? It just never happens. But there's been progressive intelligence that would blow us away, you know, of things we can't imagine how intelligent. So, so we worked on But you on. have to start at the end and design and you, think in that, that way. You That's, do, and you, and you have to open the boundaries that it could get so intelligent it'll change everything. That, that was the way I in, uh, infiltrated what I had learned at Steelcase. What IDO taught me was computer science and computer engineering will be the basis for innovation at the beginning. The usability may lag. So at your, you got to go back to when you were just learning how to use a computer. In my case, it was a black screen with green font. And or when I first tried to program my own PC, you know, I didn't know how to write basic or do any of those kinds of things. Right. I still don't. <laughs> I and, never learned. I tried. <laughs> well, and, and, and it turns out it shouldn't be. <laughs> You know, right. like, like in engineering this microphone to have our thing, we shouldn't say, well, Doug and Jim got to actually engineer that so they can speak today. But that's the way computing really asked you to participate. And it's, again, the reason is the engineers and the scientists, these are such complex topics to develop the background for it. It got celebrated as the end product. What Steve Jobs brought us, he goes, no, there's a much simpler way to engage this and then lots of other people. Um, but back to your, the promise of it is this guy, Ray Kurzweil, is one, pe- one person I listened to. I just listened to his podcast, uh, podcast with him. So he wrote a book called The Singularity is Near 18 years ago. What he, what he forecasted is the computational power and the brain's ability to compute would meet. That's why he called it the singularity. And, okay. he, and he dated it, he said, by 2029. Now, how, how could he do that? He was looking at the math of how fast computers are doubling. So there was a thing called Moore's Law that said every five years, if something costs $1,000, it would then go to one-tenth. It would be uh, 100. But at the same time, the power would go up 10x. So this is how uh, you and I are sitting with phones that have these phones we have, these iPhones, have LiDAR cameras. They can see point clouds. The computing power for that, we couldn't have imagined when Dick and I were doing the handspring, right? Right. But Kurzweil goes on to say that this curve doesn't stop. And he doesn't call it Moore's Law anymore because the Intel chips are called CPUs. They're, they're really good for uh, instruction sets in computers and things like that. But the gaming computers are called GPUs. So G- NVIDIA, which is a company I bet you've heard about, mm-hmm. so like the top investment in the last 10 years, is a GPU chip. Now what it does, it gives you the capability to do parallel processing of an assignment. So a quick lesson here. When you do software and you're telling something to, to act in the code, if it's something, and let's pick turn on, a PC turn on. <clears throat> well, it turns on every day, <clears throat> or as frequently as you do it. They reason that instead of writing the code to tell it to do that, let's just put the instruction on a chip, which then reduces the weight of the code, if you follow it. Something that's going to be repetitive is what's on the chip. So that's what chips were always made for. That's what CK was teaching us. Okay. Casio figured out what functions repeat. So once I got that understanding, uh, how do you? What's the repeatable things in a, a car that will drive itself? Well, that problem gets so heavy that you need a GPU. A GPU is just more powerful than a CPU. CPU. Also, much more expensive. Like I saw my first GPU chip; it was twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. But if you use that thing in my head, five years, it's one tenth, it's two thousand. Another five years, ten, almost ten years ago, I saw it. Mm-hmm. It's two hundred. And guess what? It's now Elon is putting GPUs in his car. 
and Ford will be doing it and not everyone. So, so I, I went down that path because this is what's enabled the chat GPTs mm-hmm. or the, what are called large language models. This wouldn't have happened if we didn't have GPU chips enabling the computer at the speed of light to look at so many variables to spit out that answer, right? So I'm spending all my time today uh, wanting to help CEOs with, okay, now let's pick an, uh, kind of a, a process that thrived in its day, but what, how could it work in a future if we had this kind of computing power behind it? So right when I was leaving Ford, I was looking at how you buy a car. <laughs> okay. And I'll leave you with this phrase, I, I, uh, and I borrowed it from some giants in, in various forms to, to formulate it. I call it design for ascending technology. And here's what it means, is what you said, which is so accurate, is AI's out here, probably upon us. Right. Well, if you, if you have a product or a business and you're waiting for you to get to that point, in other words, you meet it in its future, you have to know there's people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs that say, no, I'm going to start designing for it being here now. I have to kind of fake it because not everything's aligned, but I can start imagining the idea. So that's, I took all their thinking and my own and said, in a layman way, it's designing for the ascending technology. So. What you do is as you're building IDEO, like as you're building the prototypes, you're imagining the kind of computational power in either the product that you might be selling at Amway or the process you're using to track it or the way a customer's interacting with it. And so we could have fun talking about that, but that's the, that's the theory of design for ascending. So, so you design it in a way it, you don't have the ability to do it yet. No. So it, it's, but it, you can prototype it now. So I, that, that makes me think of what the cathedral in Barcelona, La Sagrada Familia, where the designer, the architect, designed a building that he had no idea how to build. And, and I think it's been over 100 years now, and they're still building it <laughs> because they had to figure out the technology. And this is what I love about Europe, of how these people, how they figured out how to build something. But La Sagrada was this this amazing structure because the architect went with the idea that I don't know how to build this yet. This is what I want it to look like. I don't know the materials I'm going to use or how we're going to engineer it or how it's going to you know, support itself without falling down. But I'm going to draw it and someday someone's going to figure it out. Yeah. And I thought that was the most fascinating thing. That's what you're saying. I am and that's a perfect example. And you go, so so would a listener think, well, this is, is going to take 100 years. The difference is, see, the computational compounding is going so fast. It's going so fast where the construction technology didn't do that, right? right. But, but it's the same principle. On that curve is where you're going to compete in the future. Yeah. So if, if, if you're the DeVos and Van Andel family or you're the Ford family or the Pew family, what I would say to them and I'm sincere when I say this, I may not be the guy that you want to run the company if you need to meet the next quarter's earnings. Right. Yeah. But I want to be the guy that you'll be really proud to own the company in the future because we will be there yeah. uh, really ahead of others that can be really difficult competitors. And now competing with uh, Elon, I felt really strongly how oh, he's a rocket scientist, he's brilliant. I just finished the book that Walter Isaacson wrote about him. But I would say to my team, if, again, this is kind of an odd way of thinking. Remember, I warned you. That's good. I like it. Uh, Keep going. That if you were a physicist and there's an object out there moving at the speed of light and you're behind it and you go catch it, you can't because you can't move faster, right? Right. So the only way you can do it is you have to aim over the top of where it is, which we used to call skate where the puck's going and all that. But I'd rather use the physics example because Elon is so smart. And he's not so smart that he can aim further than I can aim. Right. It's just that I have to be better at aiming out there than he, he is. And uh, I'm not making that claim, but I, I tried to change the company to think that way because that's the only way you're going to beat them. And there's things that have come from Ford or are coming from Ford that I think will, will surprise the world because of that logic. Yeah. These are really hard 
uh, Doug, internally though, because of that that uh, now I call it the now pressure, because to perform, yeah, to perform next next quarterly results, and this even, sort of thing. And even win. with broad-minded board members, right. not they can't help themselves. Yeah. Oh, we don't like seeing that number this quarter, you know. I go, it's going to be a lot better. How do we know you're right, you know? What if you're wrong? We've heard people make these kind of claims. It's because I'm not inventing a fantastical world. I'm not making up things. I'm saying, and you asked this, how did you think about technology as a force? Yeah. I learned from CK, it's always there. And then learning from computer scientists, it's compounding always. He's getting bigger and So if, if Doug DeVos were named the president of Amway again for the next 20 years, you would, and you could look back at your other self, right. yeah. you would, I know you'd make this observation. It just happened, it's happening faster. faster. And, and that's, that's what's, we could, we could spend a whole podcast saying, it's great being a CEO. I loved it. Yeah. I, you know, I did a couple of them. But what, what I don't think everyone gets is Every time you step onto the stage, it's all moving faster. Yeah. So you have to keep yourself, like we talked in football, ready for yeah. how am I going to compete now? How do you how do you stay in the game? How do you stay, how do you in, the stay in the game? Which which falls on our shoulders. Like how do we get better? So th- let's transition a little okay. bit in the, time, in the time we have left and talk yep. about sports. Okay. So we 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 we've, we've applied this technology, and, and I love that. But you're you're challenging the person to use the technology. So just like in my iPhone, I can use it for two or three functions or I can really use it to change change my life. So my daughter got married recently and I just for fun went to chat GPT and said, write me a father of the bride speech. And I gave it a few things and it was darn good. I gotta tell you, it was, <laughs> it was really, you know, just in 10 seconds, you know, it, it came back like that, but okay. That's not the speech I gave, <laughs> but, but, but but it augmented but it, it, you, it, didn't it? It helped helped yep. you think about yep. a few things. Yep. I I had some fun with it, um, but it requires the the human element, and oh. so that kind of come, brings us back to sport a little bit. Yes. So here you are, you're, you know, you you come to the University of Michigan in, in your first failed retirement <laughs> season, and. Um, how did you approach that? How did you take all these things? But, you know, technology may not have applied exactly on the football field the way you could apply it to a product development piece or something else, but it's still that type of thinking sure was. about being ahead. So talk about that a little bit of how how you applied it in a really different world of sports as, a, as the AD at the University of Michigan. And, you know, I just want to outline for you, I didn't, I wasn't looking for that job. And yeah. Dave Brandon, who I... Yeah. Uh, followed was a friend of mine. We both had the same first boss in in the Procter and Gamble company. You know when we got oh, out no of college, kidding. he was three years older than me. So, and and I always sneak this in. I gave the sitting president of Michigan the advice. I would make that work first. You know, you're calling me. He he really didn't call me to offer me the job. He just said, "How could you help?" And I said, "Well, you you gotta try and mend fences and get things back." He called three weeks later and he said, "Well, I, that didn't work." Yeah. And, and it was probably Dave's choice as much as the president's. And, I, and so I thought, oh, geez, I, I'm, not, I'm not capable of doing this job. I mean, the, that confidence thing didn't, wasn't a downer. It was just like, like you said, he thinks differently. He's talking about tech and these kind of, how am I going to apply that? Apply so, well, when I got in there, I thought about the speed of things competitively. And I started to say that the, one of the reasons, I'm not suggesting this was Brady Hoke's problem, but CEOs and coaches, I can just generalize, is that because things are moving quickly, you have to have the bandwidth to be able to deal with that pressure in addition to the, the just the normal things, right? And had I seen evidence in the football world where I thought the innovation, in addition to like they can make a touchdown on the one yard line, you know, right. the basics. And I had seen Jim's uh, Stanford USC game, just you know, like a, a, a watcher on TV. I remember being impressed by that. How they played. How they played. How he how they coached. Were coached. Yeah. And so when I got in that question of uh, picking him, uh, it was it was obvious to me that 
because I'd been a CEO, I, you got to find this capability. Right. Now, we had to go through a lot of other things to make sure the values and everything aligned, which end up being better than I thought. Right. Even, no matter what anyone thinks, he's just an extraordinarily uh, devout uh, person. And he's got a great family, and, and he, he's, he's so truthful. He's, and he meets the integrity test for me, regardless of what anybody says. He can be difficult. He can be stubborn. He can have, you know, all these things. Because <laughs> he's a good coach. <laughs> these talented, talented people that we had in business and coaching. Sure. But, you know, to get to your question, I, I literally talked to the regents about this. I said, you know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad also played for Paul Brown, and so he had a hand in the Bengals being started. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Which the board of that, they bought the red, so – our family didn't have a lot of money, but we ended up uh, with ownership in the Reds and the Bengals, and they, you know, the big red machine did really sure, well. In the, the Bengals, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and 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 I, and I, so I said when I was a kid, we couldn't get from where we lived to Cincinnati, and they weren't on TV. Right. There was no streaming. I would listen to them on radio, but if I forgot to do that, guess what I do? The next morning, I'd open the newspaper, and I and. And you could look at the box scores and you go, Johnny Bench, I wanted to know how he, you know, I was a catcher and he was a catcher. So I said to the regents, I told them that story fast, and I said, do you understand the speed of that information in the paper was enough for me to be a fan? But today, you don't have to come to the game. You don't have to come to the stadium. That's a $6 million revenue take for Michigan, you know, five years ago, so it's probably a bigger number right. per game. And they don't call the big house for nothing. No, and, and there's a lot of seats. And and if so, the the parallel experience. And I know you had, you dealt with this with the magic during the uh, pandemic. The parallel experience can be so rich in terms of the flow and speed of information. This is a technology. Why do I go? So I made the recommendation to him: we should wire the seats. With what? I said. Let's just fiber optics to them because that many people in a wireless network is t troubling, even though they've gotten really good. Well, you know, I just read about Steve Ballmer's new uh, arena. Have you read about the new no, one? No, I didn't. He's wiring every seat. Is your, the L.A.? Yeah. Yeah. A billion eight uh, stadium. And he came, I went to a game with him at Michigan because one of his kids was in the computer science there. And he asked me about, I told him that story. Now, I'm not suggesting that he did that because of me. Yeah. But, but what I said to the regents, we don't know what we'll put through it. But if you don't have the channel, so to speak, but I had ideas. Yeah. Like, what if, what if in your seat you could actually hear what the quarterback was calling the huddle? Yeah. Now, you'd have to be careful because you didn't want the Purdue coaches to hear <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you don't want the wrong people to hear that sort of <laughs> but thing. But that's a design problem, yeah. which means you got to have the capability. So, yeah, Doug, I applied that. Then the other thing, and this wasn't my idea, but there were – they put these sensors on the athletes, you know, so yeah. they can see how much the muscles are moving. Uh, the collisions and the helmets, those yeah. are on a track to – have accelerometers in them, you know, like we have in our phones. So mm -hmm. if they if they take a collision, the collective you know you know you the know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. That'll apply a lot. I took uh, pains to because we were Adidas uh, uh, sponsored, and we went to Nike. So I went to Adidas, Under Armour, Nike, and looked at. It, and I, one of the things I evaluate is what's the technology, technology. in your product. Yeah. And I didn't, I promise you, I behaved. I didn't go off on a big lecture yeah. <laughs> about ascending technology, but I was thinking about it then. I wanted them, because we signed a 10-year deal. Where are you going? It's not where you are right now. Where no. are you going to be? And they were reluctant, because that's competitive. You know, they didn't want to tell me, but that's really, so it, it applies in spades in that way. Now, in our recent experience, the whole distribution, we sat in the AD meeting and Jim, uh, our, our commissioner, he said, we've signed a TV contract for X number of years. I have to be careful because I don't want to get him in trouble. And I said, that's too long. And he goes, well, why? One of the other athletic directors said, why? And I said, well, because in five years. It's going to change. It's going to change. Dramatically. And they go, well, but we have a commitment. And I said, well, no, but in five years, you go get a new commitment. Yeah. And, and that was foreign to athletic directors, the way we would be in business, because they just needed the money so badly. So that 
Jim Delaney, that got changed. I, yeah. I shortened the agreement. Well, now, if you see what's happened to the Big Ten, oh I have no idea that was going to happen. How many teams are in the Big Ten? I can't keep count anymore. Eight, is there up to 18, eight, 18 or something? Yeah, like, but the whole platform anymore. of that distribution yeah. is what's causing it, the, you know, and streaming. And now, uh, with Google involved and Amazon, what do you think you're going to be able to do on your iPad while you're streaming? You know, they're, they're putting four... NFL games on one, mm-hmm. but that's not all I want to do. I want to be able to layer the statistics. What you did in basketball, which they're trying to copy during the pandemic, would when you would watch them in that one arena, but they had all the data and you know everything was streaming. Everything oh, I heard the users loved all yeah. that. You know, so so yeah, you'd hear me go on and on about this, but I would leave you with this just one principle, which is in nature anything that isn't virtuous gets dies yeah so there's no guarantee that a business has or a football team has a future unless you unless the virtues that make you great some you keep but you're you're reinventing that all the time so as i've gotten older this is why i said pull me back somebody says would you do this or that i don't want to over exaggerate that but i've had people come say would you step in and do something i go no because you need the utility of drive and resilience and to be able to go to China and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. So fascinating. But I, I love, I, I just, you know, and it comes through all the time how you look at things differently. Yeah. And, and, and that's where, you know, if we look at whether it's the technology on our phones and our lives, you know, whatever the device is in our home, you know, just in living, we, you know, you don't have to be running a company or running a, a, a athletic program at a major university to think about things differently and, and to to challenge ourselves to apply different ideas in our lives so we can find a way to live a better life. And and it comes down, and I love that you ended on on virtue. You know, I, I, we talked a, a little bit earlier about the National Constitution Center. And as we get ready to celebrate the 250th of the United States, you go back to the Declaration of Independence, and we talk a lot about the, 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 the part where it says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the discussion about that with the scholars there is that it's not about feeling good. It's about being good, yeah. the pursuit of being mm. good. Mm. And so we live in this world with all these things happening around us. Mm. And so the, the challenge, and you're talking about these incredible ideas of how you've applied them you know, in the roles that you've had, but you're also touching about how you apply them in the life that you lead. Yeah, it, and, it, and that, you know, so, so. And think about what think, I said about your dad. Yeah. You know, his biggest thing was the, and I said this to him the job you did raising such four great kids you know I know them all yeah. they're all great and and I the reason I say that to you I'm, I'm not a peer of yours Rich but my father used to talk about that was the thing he had most pride in I, and, and when I met Michael Jordan you know because I got to meet him with the Nike contract uh, he loved his father, you know, when it, it tragically had an end. And I said, you know, that's what I respected about you. So, so in the in the milieu of technology and all the good and bad things about it, I mean, it's it's often used for evil. You know, you can go online and pornography, you know, is the biggest thing. You could see uh, chat structures where somebody evil could do destruction. But Doug, it's one of your superpowers is. If you have leaders who can see the state of that, they don't, they don't uh, ignore it, but they paint a picture of the optimism in our lives is why I have so much respect for you and, and your family. And I, and I mean that, is the optimism for what we can do with these things in the hands of good people, it's unbounded. Yeah. And guess what it'll do? It'll overwhelm the bad people yeah. because the virtues to them matter more than the other kind of outcomes. The idea that they can see a movie of themselves 
And they go, I think it's really important that I see myself as a good dad yeah. or, uh, you know, or have a good marriage or take care of my kids or because we all get challenged in all those things. So um, the, the, the notion of us helping you and I in our, broad, uh, our podcast today, saying to people in the face of all the cool things we've got to do, don't forget how much we actually think about this, yeah. the, 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 the virtues and values of what makes up imperfect people. Yeah. And then we have to keep working at that um, is, is my endorsement for you. But th those are the two things that, you know, you're, you're applying technology and all this other, but you're also applying these principles. That's and right. These values and these virtues in your life, and you have to make decisions. And so it kind of comes back to the, you know, the, the of believe. What do you believe? And, yeah. and how are you going to do that? Because we all, you know, and, 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 and uh, actually it was at the Steelcase Learning Center where it, it had a, a line there. It says, nothing changes until the leader changes. Mm. And I remember being there, and I remember looking at that and thinking that, say, well, you can go to a big organization, say, well, it's the, it's the big boss or it's this or that. But in our life, it's us. It's each and every one of us. So nothing's going to change in my life until I decide to make a different decision about this or that I love or something that. else. You know, I, I had a line. I had a really stressful thing happen at Ford that involved some bad behavior in some people. And then as I pulled on it, you know, I didn't like where it was going. And we fixed it. But I decided to give a speech on what kind of people are we going to be, which then makes the company what it is, right. you know. And that's what you just said, is it, it had to start with me. What kind of person am I going to be? I'm imperfect. You have to know that, right? Because it'd be too we narcissistic to, to say. But, but I'm working on this. I'm a project, you know. And I need you to join me in working on the kinds, which, which if you say, what, what was the point? Well, how do we treat others? Yeah. If, are you misogynistic? You know, the women are women being treated fairly in business. That was a big problem sure. in the in the auto industry. I think it was male dominated. Uh, we, we we have diversity from all over the world. Like you were just talking to me about the Purdue president. Yeah. And if you haven't traveled the world, can you can you make way? These are all the things that are the virtues in the future if you really want to compete, right? Mm -hmm. But it starts with who do I want to be in that yeah. world? Yeah, exactly. You can you can opt out. If, if we're asking you too much. But if you want us to be this kind of company, we need you to become that kind of person, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. No, great. Jim, this has been so much fun. Yeah. We're, we're, we've wandered all over the place. And, <laughs> and, and as we yeah, as we catch up on fun stories, uh, 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 just, you know, connecting together in our, our relationship and then connect that with ascending, you know, ascending, ascending technologies and, and how to think about that. You know, maybe just uh, kind of give you a little opportunity to kind of, you know, just, you know, if you have a, a, a thought to share or kind of a closing thought to share about how, how you, you know, if as you maybe take that time and you look back on all these things, whether it's, you know, a Bo Schembechler or President Ford or a Bob Pugh or, you know, uh, the others that you've mentioned, the experiences that you've had, just kind of how it's, how has that kind of come to impact Jim today and, and Jim tomorrow? As, as we covered some of this, I, I, would, I would put a signature on it that said, I think we're, I'm most at peace with the people you've mentioned, including you, is to see your life in service of others. You know, and that's, that's um, and not everybody can do everything, right? Either don't have the means or the talent or, but I think every day, I used to say you can get up and you have something bugging you, you, Tell yourself you get an hour a day for you, and the rest you ought to give to others, yeah. you know. And it could be as a leader, you know, how, what kind of day you have it, you know, what can I help you with? It can be as in, in your community, you know, uh, seeing people that need things. It can be your families, you know, that, that need you to be there, to be present. Um, we both have wonderful wives, and I, I know the trait of we try to fix things, and they just want us to listen. That's right. <laughs> so, so that, that, that being in service, Doug, is that never runs out of fashion. Yeah. And as I move into this phase of my life, I, I've been you know, rewarding 
uh, by meeting with people like you and asking questions, what do you need? Where where do you th- where can I help the most? Been rewarded by that. Um, I'm I'm developing that. So I've opened a little office downtown, and I'm and I have a lab in there, and I uh, I'm working on some things with right. others. So that's that's the life today. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Well, yeah. Jim, I I can just uh, uh, just acknowledge that in every interaction, every experiences I've had with you, it's it, you are thinking about others and you're putting others first and you're putting your incredible mind and curiosity and innovative thinking and and perspective in the service of trying to figure out how to help others. Sometimes that has you leading a, a large <laughs> or a company. Sometimes it has you leading a, a, an athletic department. Uh, but I think you're most happy leading yourself and and interacting with Kathy and your family, that's uh, uh, that's number one with a bullet. But so thank you. I can't I can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to share with with all of our listeners here what uh, your your knowledge, your experience, uh, and, and your perspectives on life. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you, Doug.